Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. And thank you for joining our webinar today, the who, what, when, why, and how of the Evidence for Action updated call for proposals. Evidence for Action, or E for A for short, is a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation based at the Center for Health and Community at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm Erin Hagan, the Deputy Director for Evidence for Action. During the webinar, we'll be discussing the basics of the program as well as what's new in the call for proposals, the submission process, and what it means to be an e for a grantee. The webinar will be recorded and archived later on our website for reviewing. We've also already received some questions from participants through the registration process. And throughout the webinar, please send us any questions you may have through the chat feature, and we'll address those at the end of the presentation. We have a lot to cover today, so let's get right into it. Let me turn to my co-presenter, Nancy Adler, to introduce yourself. Hi. Hi, this is Nancy Adler. I serve as the Director of the National Program Office for E4A here at UCSF, where I also direct the Center for Health and Community. I'd like to add my welcome to those of you who've joined us for the webinar today, and let me turn you back at this point to Erin. Great. So I'll just take a minute to go over our agenda for today's webinar. We released an updated call for proposals or a CFP on April 2nd. And it's been a while since we've hosted a webinar about our rolling CFP. So while the updates to the call served as the impetus for this session today, we do want to spend a little time going over all the things that haven't changed, the mission, the goals, the process for applying, etc. And of course, we'll also highlight the new aspects of the CFP. We also want to share some information about how to submit a letter of intent, what are the possible outcomes of that submission, and finally, we'll talk more about what it means to be an E4A grantee. We'll leave plenty of time at the end to answer your questions, and again, please submit questions through the chat feature at the bottom left-hand side of the screen. You can also let us know in that chat feature if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, and someone from ReadyTalk will monitor the chat and be able to help you if that's the case. So without further ado, Nancy, let me turn to you to talk about the mission of Evidence for Action. Terrific. Thank you. Our mission remains the same. It's to support research evaluating the impact of interventions on health, equity, and well-being. We welcome research on a wide range of interventions, including those that are not specifically designed to impact health, but where there's reason to believe that they would have such effects based either on theory and or preliminary or related evidence. We're an investigator-initiated program. What this means is that we don't limit applicants to pre-specified research questions. So what we'll be talking about more today are the characteristics of proposed research that are a better fit for funding. So let me turn to what's a, what is a good fit. E4A looks for rigorous evaluations of the health impacts of various kinds of interventions. These findings should inform efforts to improve population health, reduce inequities, and establish generalizable best practices. We also allot a small portion of our portfolio for developing and validating new measures of population health. So let me add a few clarifying points to this. When we say rigorous evaluations, we mean that research studies should be designed in a way that causal inference may be drawn, and either a positive or even null findings will provide useful information. There should also be a clear data-driven research question and hypotheses and, an, and use of an appropriate comparison group. We consider health outcomes to include the physical, emotional, mental, and developmental health outcomes, as well as well-being. We also consider behaviors or other factors that are well, well enough established to be clear determinants of health. And lastly, we very broadly define interventions as programs, policies, or practices. We're a rolling submission program. That means we have no deadlines for submission, so you can submit an application at any time. We can also respond relatively quickly to time-sensitive research funding requests, and we encourage researchers to take advantage of natural experiments 
which involve changes in large-scale programs, policies, or practices, and sometimes can provide unique opportunities to establish causation. What we don't fund are descriptive or exploratory science, literature reviews, needs assessments, or validation of screening tools. We also don't fund the costs of running the intervention. We focus on, oh, actually, none of the, we don't cover the costs of actually running it or program implementation or operations. Our funding is focused on the research aspect of the project. So let me move now to the action framework that is we've uh, based our, our program on from Robert Wood Johnson's vision. The work funded through EFRA is meant to align with the culture of health action framework, and there are four action areas in the framework which I'll be describing. The first is action area one, making health a shared value. This action area reflects the importance of establishing a population health mindset, strengthening people's connectedness to their communities in ways that spur collective action, and civic engagement to bring about changes to society that enable populations to thrive. At EFRA, we're especially interested in the extent to which social norms and values can be changed through interventions and can result in better health, well-being, and equity outcomes. Moving to the second action area, this is the action area two, fostering cross-sector collaboration. This reflects on the role the collaboration plays in achieving positive and sustainable population health improvements. In the context of EFRA, we're interested in, in empirical studies evaluating the health impacts resulting from cross-sector collaboration. Now, this means situating a partnership or collaboration as the intervention. In, and in this case, the appropriate comparison group is another setting where a similar effort was being advanced absent a partnership or cross-sector collaboration. Let me turn then to area three, creating healthier, more equitable communities. This reflects the needs to better understand how community-level programs and policies impact population health and equity. Research across multiple settings is generally needed to determine the characteristics of programs or policies that yield the greatest health impacts and whether health benefits offset the cost of investments. And finally, action area four is strengthening the integration of health services and systems. And this reflects the need for evidence on how healthcare systems can effectively work with non-healthcare systems or organizations, such as those providing supportive housing, healthy food access, or early childhood education. Now, research funded through EFRA should be aligned with the culture of health vision and action framework. And you should think critically about how your work will inform these action areas. However, you don't need to specify directly which action areas your research relates to in your application. We should be able to see that based on what you're planning to do. So let me turn this back to Aaron, who can now describe the criteria that we use to evaluate proposals. Thanks, Nancy. So applications are evaluated on six selection criteria as outlined in our call for proposal. Rigor, actionability, relevance, contribution to the evidence base, inclusion of appropriate health outcome measures, and feasibility. We go into more detail in the call for proposals and on our website in our frequently asked questions section about how we define these criteria. But to give you a little sense right now, when we say rigorous evaluations, we mean research studies should be designed in a way that causal inference may be drawn and either positive or null findings will provide useful information. There should be a clear data-driven research question and hypothesis and an appropriate comparison group, as you mentioned. We consider health outcomes, again, to reiterate, to include physical, emotional, mental, and developmental health and well-being, as well as behaviors or other factors that are well-established determinants of health. And again, we very broadly define interventions as programs and policies and practices. So, um, the actionability of the findings is something that's really important to evidence for action, and we hence our name, 
We are looking into how the research findings inform decisions around policy making, program implementation, funding, and changing practices. Nancy, you did a nice job of talking about how we think about the relevance of the research with respect to the Foundation's action framework. And then when we're thinking about contribution of the evidence base, we want to know that the research findings will help bridge current gaps in evidence and knowledge. Feasibility refers to the budget, the grant period, the capacity of the team, whether you have access to the data that's necessary and the populations that are proposed to be part of the study, and whether or not the team can carry out the research design. So these are really our criteria we consider both at the letter of intent and at the full proposal stage. Of course, more information is provided at the full proposal stage, but the letter of intent should really try to focus on uh, highlighting especially the rigor and actionability of the research. So most of the logistics of the program haven't changed. As Nancy previously mentioned, we still accept applica applications on a rolling basis, and we don't have a specific budget limit for our grant awards. Having said that, we do consider the budget when making funding recommendations, and we have to make trade-offs between the costs of a study and the potential value of the findings. For this reason, lower budget requests are viewed favorably, and budget requests over half a million dollars are more highly scrutinized. We still have the, a two-stage application process. There is an initial unsolicited letter of intent stage followed by an invited full proposal stage. We've received over 1,800 letters of intent since we launched the program in June of 2015. Due to this high volume of interest in the program, our solicitation system was getting a little bogged down. So in concert with updating our call for proposals, we also opened a new application system. Now, this only has implications for applicants who opened an application prior to April 2nd of 2019. So if you've opened a, an application since then, you don't have anything to worry about or anything to even consider. But if you did open an application prior to April 2nd, you have until the end of the month to complete and submit your letter of intent. If you're not able to submit your letter by the end of April, not a problem. You can open a new application through the new link in our updated call for proposals. If you have any questions about this process or how it may or may not apply to you, please contact the Evidence for Action Program Office. We know that two pages is not a lot of space to thoroughly describe a complex research project. So let's talk about what information to prioritize in your letter of intent. Less than half a page should focus on the rationale behind the research you propose. We don't want you to illustrate why the issue is important. Rather, you should describe the intervention you're evaluating and explain why the research will contribute to advancing knowledge, information, and action. You also can share any pilot data that you have in this section. The bulk of the letter, more than a page, should be devoted to the research approach and activities. More explicitly, you should provide specific research questions or hypotheses that will be examined, and you should outline your approach for answering those questions. Indicate the sample size, describe the intervention and control groups, how many people are assigned to each group, and how those assignments are made. Specify the primary and secondary outcomes of interest, the data sources and collection procedures, as well as the methods for analysis. Finally, in less than four sentences, describe the qualifications and capacity of the team to conduct the research. This area should not be a summary of information that is otherwise reflected in the CVs that are submitted with the application or the resumes of the principal investigators, but should focus on any unique partnerships or capacities not otherwise included in those documents. You do not need to include references or citations in your letter of intent. And there are more details about the exact information and questions you should be responding to in the template for the letter in the application and review system. And I encourage people to follow the instructions in the template when submitting. We do not provide 
feedback on letters of intent prior to submission through the application and review system, but if you are invited to submit a full proposal, we will provide more detailed descriptions um, and questions for you to respond to, and you will provide a more detailed description of your research plan in a 10-page narrative accompanied by a dissemination strategy, a detailed budget worksheet and narrative, and other technical information about the application and the research approach. The dissemination plan is an important component of a full proposal and is meant to encourage applicants to think through the actions and decisions your research is designed to inform beyond shaping future research. You'll need to identify decision makers and other audiences who will be able to use your evidence in actionable ways and the ways in which you'll go about sharing your findings to those audiences. So let's talk a little bit about what happens after you submit a letter of intent. There are in fact a number of possible outcomes. You may receive a turndown, or you may be asked to submit a full proposal. You could also be asked to revise and resubmit your letter of intent, or you could be invited to one of our technical assistance services. If you are invited to revise and resubmit your letter of intent or to submit a full proposal, we will include questions or comments about your proposed research in the notice. If you receive a turndown, we do not provide unsolicited feedback, but you may call or email the program office and someone from our team may provide more details about our decision with you. We also have common reasons for turndowns included on our website in our Frequently Asked Questions section. We should be fully transparent in noting that only about 8% of letters of intent are invited on to the full proposal stage. The biggest challenges at the LOI stage are usually related to the study design or methodological approach, and so we've developed two technical assistance services to help address these issues. For design consultation, Evidence for Action staff work with you or the applicant via a series of phone video conference consultations to enhance the rigor, feasibility, or potential impacts of the study design while maintaining the core aims of your proposal. Our matching service is provided by the Accelerating Collaboration for Evidence team housed at John Hopkins University. The ACE team facilitates partnerships between those implementing community-level initiatives and researchers who can aid in developing and conducting a rigorous evaluation of the intervention. If you are interested in being referred to the matching service, there is a box in the Letter of Intent application system that you can check to indicate your interest. Although I should note that Indicating interest does not guarantee a referral to the service. Applications are still reviewed and assessed for uh, fit with the program and compatibility with the vision and goals of Evidence for Action. If you'd like to learn more about these technical assistance services, I encourage you to join us for a separate webinar where we will go into much more detail about these services happening on Thursday, April 25th at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. So as you've heard, most of what's in our call for proposals is actually consistent with what has, we've been uh, soliciting over the last few years. But let's talk about the few new provisions that we've included. For the first time, we are allowing research teams that include international members. Proposed research teams may be composed of both U.S. and international members, including the principal investigator, co-PI, co-investigators, and other team members, as long as the lead applicant organization is based in the U.S. or its territories. We are also willing to consider research that is conducted outside of the United States that demonstrates clear relevance and applicability to building a culture of health in the U.S. We've also gotten a little more flexible with our grant durations. Our preference is still to fund projects that can demonstrate findings in the near term, 36 months or shorter. But we now will consider applications for 48 month durations with sufficient justification. This may include capturing longer term outcomes, allowing for interventions like construction or redevelopment projects that often carry, require more time to carry out. We also
have clearly laid out the expectations we have of our grantees in the call for proposals. And I'll go into this a little, in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Finally, most studies funded through Evidence for Action must include measures of health outcomes. The exception to this are those projects focused solely on making health a shared value. For research that is evaluating an intervention that is explicitly focused on making health a shared value, we have lifted the requirement for measuring health outcomes as the primary outcomes and will allow measures of changes in these drivers of shared values as primary outcomes. I should say that we do still prioritize projects that are able to measure health outcomes, but we have learned over the course of the program that this ability to link Interventions related to making health a shared value to longer term health outcomes have, a more, have been more challenging to design. The three drivers that form the basis of Action Area 1, making health a shared value, are mindsets and expectations, sense of community, and civic engagement. These three drivers embody an array of related constructs and measures, and together they point to the importance of shared values in promoting population health. More information about how we think about research related to making health a shared value is hyperlinked in the call for proposals and available on our website. Finally, to focus on our grantee expectations. In the updated call for proposals, we've added information about what it means to be an E4A grantee. Our program requirements have implications for grant budgets and timelines, as well as the activities we expect grantees to engage in during the grant period. We're trying to be more transparent about these requirements early on so that applicants know what to expect when they apply. One of our goals is to foster grantee, a grantee network in which participants can learn from one another, build upon or add to existing skill sets, and potentially collaborate with each other in the future. These opportunities happen at an annual in-person meeting and at various times throughout the year via virtual meetings. At the program office, we also want to work closely with our grantees to have regular check-ins to understand how projects are progressing to help celebrate your successes and also to contribute to problem solving when challenges arise. We expect grantees to register their studies with Open Science Framework. This is for the transparency and accountability for grantees and the program office as well as the broader scientific community. An important component of our mission is to turn the research into action. Again, hence our name, Evidence to action, for Action. In order to do this, we ask our grantees to work with us to ensure your findings are reaching decision makers. This is part of why we ask, ask you to budget for open access uh, publication, and also why we focus so much on the dissemination plan. We ask that you go beyond publishing in academic journals because we want people to use the research and make sure it's not hidden behind a paywall. But we also want to make sure you think about other venues besides journals and the language, media, and channels you use to reach those audiences. The dissemination strategy that is developed in the full proposal will continue to evolve throughout the grant time frame, time frame as we identify appropriate applications for your research. I know this is a lot of information to digest, and I see that there have been a number of questions coming in throughout the discussion. So let's turn now to the questions, uh, and, ha and we'll spend the rest of our time responding to your inquiries. So one of the first questions that we received was about partnering with nonprofits to complete evaluation work and asking whether it matters who the lead application or applicant organization is, whether there are preferences for affiliation um, and the, chance, the chances of receiving funding based on those affiliations. So the response really is that we do not have an, a preference for the applic lead applicant organization except that they be based in the United States. Otherwise, we really ask applicants to think about which organization has the best capacity to monitor and administer the, the fiscal dollars of the grant. 
we do value teams in which there are multiple different sectors and organizations and institutions represented, but the lead applicant really should be based on the capacity of that organization to administer the grant. Nancy, anything you'd like to add to that response? No, I think that, that covers it. it. We expect that it will be a collaborative relationship and the, whichever organization is the lead organization will be encompassing the perspectives and needs of all, the, all grantees on that project. Great. Let me then well, uh, turn to you for the next question, which is, what characteristics make for a strong proposal in terms of data sources or sample size or budget, some of the features of strong proposals? Well, the, the strongest proposals, first of all, have a very clear research question that is potentially falsifiable. So you want to, you want to pose a question not just, you know, I want to explore the causes of this, but that you have a prediction of what that the intervention or policy or whatever it is you're studying does have an impact on outcomes, and you can test in a rigorous way whether that outcome can be attributed to the intervention. And that means having a large enough sample size to be able to pick up an effect using validated measures or measures that you can argue are valid in other ways, uh, and have control over confounds. The question about budget is the, the hardest one to answer because there isn't a, we don't have a clear cap. What we do is we balance the cost of doing the research with how both feasible and important it is. So we're, you know, if it's riskier, if it answers a narrow question, we might still fund it at one budget level but not at a higher level. But that's a, that's a, difficult judgment call, and that's actually where we have most of our, much of our discussion. Uh, so what we ask is that you pose the question that you think is the most important one to answer and give us your best estimates of what it would really take to do it in a rigorous and impactful way. Great. Thanks, Nancy. I see that there are a number of questions coming in asking for clarification around what is meant when we say we don't fund the implementation or programmatic activities. So let's try to give a little bit more uh, understand, offer a little more understanding about that. It means that if you're evaluating an intervention, we do not fund the program itself. So we don't fund the intervention. We fund everything related, though, to the evaluation. So. Uh, we fund the time of people who are participating in the research, and that doesn't just mean the person who's crunching data. It means the people who are collecting data and the people who are um, participating in the study. Uh, it also means that we could fund stipends for participation, for example. We can fund travel costs, and we can include equipment and other sorts of materials or infrastructure that is needed for either assessing or analyzing or collecting data. We can also fund access to data if you're doing a secondary data analysis. But to give a more concrete example, perhaps, if you are implementing a, a program that delivers fresh food to people's homes, we would not cover or not fund the cost of the the food that is being delivered, for example. Uh, Nancy, any additional nuance or examples you want to offer? Yeah, I can give an example of a health se sector intervention like navigation to help link patients to social services. We would not pay for the cost of the navigation and the navigators, but we would pay the cost of the evalu evaluating the outcomes of having that service. Great. Good to have a couple examples from a couple different sectors. So a similar question, again, sort of I think people trying to understand more clearly what is in and what is out. So there's a question about what is meant by exploratory research. Uh, so 
to start, I would say we really fund evaluations of interventions. So we don't fund research that is trying to design an intervention or understand the context or the connections between an environment or uh, a situation and people's outcomes. We really want to know how intervening in a specific environment or on a specific factor impact people's longer term outcomes. Uh, basically, we want you to do something and while you're doing it, evaluate whether or not it works. Nancy, other nuances for how we think about exploratory versus uh, the type of research that we do fund? Yeah, I think some people may think of exploratory also as pilot. So you know, you're testing something out in a small number and we will not fund pilot studies because we really want things that are a little farther along where it's quite plausible that they could have an impact and that policymakers would be convinced by the data. So we generally ask, you don't have to have preliminary data, um, but if, there's, if it's really a, a novel area that's never been tried, never been tested, it would be helpful to have some pilot data. Um, but we, don't, we, we are not able to fund those early stages. Right. And that raises a point about sample size and power calculations. And so we really do want, want studies to be powered, as we've mentioned numerous times, to detect either a positive or null finding, meaning you have a sample size that is large enough to detect an effect based on the intervention you are evaluating. And so that varies. There's not one set sample size that we're looking for. It varies depending on the intervention, depending on the outcomes that you're measuring, et cetera. Um, but Nancy, could, maybe you can speak just briefly on the nuance of evidence for action and the fact that we're evaluating interventions that often aren't designed to impact health outcomes and what that means for how we expect to see an outcome on health versus, for example, if there were an intervention designed to improve financial security, what does that mean in how we think about whether or not it also impacts health? Well, what we're looking for are really novel ways and effective ways of looking at health impacts. So it may be using secondary data or if you're in a, a geographic area where there's a predominant healthcare system using electronic health records that can be linked to the settings where you're intervening or not. So there may be different ways of trying to make those linkages. Let me say one other thing about power because we, we also spend a fair amount of time talking about when people give us a power analysis is the, are the assumptions of what the impact size and effect size will be justified is again a judgment call. And we're not just looking for statistical significance, we're looking at the question of clinical significance. So it may be that a something will have a small effect, but over a large population that will have a large population attributable effect. In other cases, if you expect a whopping effect, you may not need a large number of people to find it, but you, you need some reason to believe you'll find a whopping effect. So it very much depends on your population and your question and how clear, clear it is what kind of impact the intervention would have. Yes, absolutely. And this begs a question from qualitative researchers who uh, may, may think about their sample sizes differently, of course, about whether we have a preference for quantitative or qualitative data. So I'll start, but then turn to you, Nancy, to say we have funded one purely qualitative study at Evidence for Action, so uh, we do not exclude qualitative research. More commonly, qualitative is combined with quantitative in a mixed methods approach. And there certainly are instances in which it's really important to qualitatively understand and provide context for the quantitative findings that we're seeing. Uh, but there are, there are distinctions and there are times when we have asked people to remove qualitative components of a mixed method study and there have been instances in which we've asked people to add a qualitative component to a purely quantitative study. So Nancy, do you want to talk just a little bit about how we think about when qualitative is particularly 
informative and times when we think maybe we're not ready for the qualitative component yet? Well, the issue often with qualitative research is, is it falsifiable? Uh, is it being done in such a way that you could find out that something really doesn't work? That's why we put this emphasis on positive results are helpful, but we hope that the studies are well enough designed that even null effects can tell us something. And it's important to know what either what doesn't work or if something isn't working, why it is. Is it a problem of implementation? Is the underlying premise wrong? Is it being done in a way that doesn't cohere? Uh, or was the sample size just too small to see it? So sometimes the qualitative can give you some ideas of the conditions under which it works or the the subgroups that may impact differently. Um, but it usually is in the context of some kind of grounding it in some kind of quantitative data collection because of the issue of, you know, can you actually make conclusions about whether it works or not. Yep. Great. Thank you. Sticking a little bit on this methods um, train, there also is a question about within the quantitative methods, do we allow quasi-experimental approaches or are we really focused on RCTs, randomized controlled trials? So we absolutely allow quasi-experimental designs. And in fact, most of what we have funded is some form of quasi-experimental approach, although there are a few randomized controlled trials that you will see are part of the evidence for action portfolio. We, as we mentioned, really want people to think through how to best draw causal inference. We also are funding a lot of research about interventions that are happening in the real world. And sometimes it's possible to randomize people even in the real world, especially when resources are limited. But that's not always feasible in real world implementation. And so quasi-experimental approaches are certainly appropriate as long as you're really thinking through how to isolate the intervention as the causal effect. Nancy, anything you want to add to that? Response? No, I think that's exactly right. The, uh, you know, it is quite difficult to randomize, but there are times when you actually can can do it when and people don't necessarily think of that possibility. Uh, as Aaron was saying, when resources are scarce, actually often the the people see the fairest way of allocating them to be a lottery, and an RCT is a basically a kind of lottery, which is by chance people are able to get the scarce resource or not. Uh, so we do encourage people to think creatively about is it possible to actually randomize exposure. The great thing about randomization is it just takes care of so many alternative explanations. It's actually much harder to do a quasi-experimental design where you're having to think about all the different ways it's, there could be bias introduced or confounds. So we, um, we would rather see uh, a good quasi-experimental design on an important question in a population and carefully set out how it will be determined than a trivial RCT on something that's easy to randomize but not very important. So again, it's weighing the methodology, the importance of the project, and then obviously that will have implications for budget. So there are some questions about outcomes, asking a little more about what we would approve as an outcome or not. And so I, there were a couple of specific questions about is healthcare utilization considered a, an appropriate outcome, for example. And I want to start by saying one of the unique factors of evidence for action is that we actually allow data collection and analysis on many outcomes. So we don't limit you to only one outcome, but we do want you to specify which outcomes you think are primary and most likely to be impacted by the intervention. And we also recognize that while we care deeply about the health outcomes, and in particular the population health outcomes of an intervention, sometimes, especially when an intervention, again, was not designed to impact health, the decision makers who decide whether to fund a program or implement a policy their primary concern is not about health, and in which case you should be collecting outcome measures that matter to those decision makers as well. You also should think about whether or not an interim indicator is suggestive of or whether there is evidence that it 
impacts longer term health outcomes because as we mentioned, our grant periods are typically about three years, if not shorter. And so we recognize that some outcomes take much longer to see impacts from. And so it's important to think about the pathway to those longer term outcomes. We generally do not accept access to care or health care coverage as the sole health outcomes. Uh, but we do accept some types of health care utilization outcomes, such as preventable emergency department visits. Nancy, other uh, detail about the outcomes you might want to share? Yeah, you know, the most common one that we get is utilization because that's accessible from electronic health records. The problem with just having utilization is some interventions should actually increase utilization of some sorts, you know, like primary care and focus on preventive conditions. Uh, others are really geared to try and reduce utilization. So it really, the problem is utilization is a kind of crude overall measure for reflection of health. It can reflect poorer health, but it can also reflect access, and those may be working in opposite directions. So there would have to be a clear statement of the type of utilization and why it's a good outcome and reflects underlying health of the population, not just at their access to the care. Absolutely. There's a sort of specific question, again, about methods. Does your interest extend to simulation modeling of impacts of potential intervention approaches? Or are we really looking for actual programs, policies, and practices? So I would say, first of all, that Evidence for Action is a very interdisciplinary program, which means that we have to be cognizant of the types of methods and approaches and science for different disciplines. And we try to be very aware of that. So for example, in climate studies, it's very common to do modeling studies. And so generally, we have been less uh, receptive to modeling studies. However, as I mentioned, it really is sort of contextual depending on the state of the science in the field and the type of intervention. Nancy, do you have some other thoughts about simulation modeling? No, well, actually, I have a, in some ways, it's a, it's a free association to it more than an answer because I think your answer was very good. My free association to it is, that we are trying to build the empirical basis of policy making and action. So it's really how well a given study, whether it's a simulation or not, captures data that would be compelling. And yeah, the other, actually the, an even freer free association is the fact that we have a letter of intent stage we really designed this to be the kind of program we would want to be able to apply to, which is the first part of it is not terribly onerous. It's not like having to write an NIH grant that can take you three months to write and still has a chance, less than a 10% chance of getting funded. We have also, we realize somewhat daunting numbers, but we've made the initial barrier not terribly high. So if you, if you are working on a simulation, you can do a two-page letter of intent and get an answer about whether it would be acceptable to us or not. Perfect. So I would encourage you to, if you have something that doesn't quite fit but you think it's an important question and you think it might be compelling to go ahead and submit a letter of intent. Absolutely. So there are a few questions about uh, whether you can submit to multiple for action programs and the distinction between evidence for action and the other for action programs. So let me try to tackle that. First of all, I'll start, but for those of you who don't know, there are four signature research funding programs of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, evidence for action, systems for action, policies for action, and health data for action. Currently, only evidence for action has an open call for proposals. Our call for proposals is open year-round, and we have no deadlines for submission. You may submit multiple applications to Evidence for Action, 
and you may submit multiple applications across programs. We would ask that you not submit the same application to multiple programs. So if Systems for Action or Policies for Action have an open call for proposals, we ask that you not submit the same application across all three programs. The distinctions among the programs are to a great extent logistical. Evidence for Action Ha, again, has no deadline for submission. We have no research agenda, meaning we don't have specified areas of interest or questions of interest. Policies and systems for action do usually uh, issue research agendas where they have very broad topical areas of interest when they uh, have an open call for proposals. Not specific research questions, but broad areas of interest. They also both issue shorter awards for smaller budgets they do have budget caps on their awards. Evidence for Action will fund anything that systems or policies for action might fund from a content perspective, especially while those programs are closed. Policies for Action focuses explicitly on laws, policies, both institutional policies and legal policies. And Systems for Action focuses more explicitly on the integration of systems and services with the healthcare finance and delivery system. But again, the, the big difference is that we're open all the time. And so we don't want to have applicants spend too much time trying to distinguish among the programs. We do co collaborate internally to, when all of the programs are open simultaneously to review proposals with an eye towards which program they best belong to. And then we either reach out to applicants to direct them in the to the appropriate program or we can have conversations briefly to help you distinguish which program to apply to if one of the other four action programs is open at the same time. Again, currently none of the other four action programs have open calls for proposals, and so evidence for action is your best bet. So uh, another question that has come up is about whether uh, what sort of infrastructure is needed for a competitive research proposal. So when they said thank you for, submit, for clarifying what you mean by infrastructure when you submitted that question, so they're saying, for example, should the research team already be assembled? Um, should we already have identified what the intervention is that we're going to evaluate? So Nancy, do you want to kick us off with that response? Sure. Well, first of all, it would be, I think it would be very hard to write a letter of intent to evaluate an intervention that you don't have yet. So yes, that, that really needs to be well specified. And in terms of the research team, you don't have to have every last person identified, but there needs to be enough research strength both in how the letter of intent is written as well as the if there's somebody on the team. And again, the researcher does not have to be a PI. It could, it could be a community group who has partnered with a researcher. But um, you need to know that there's enough skill and research to be able to carry out the research and to do the analysis and, inter and interpret it. Um, one of the reasons we did the matching service is that there are community organizations, for example, who have a very interesting intervention that's promising. They've done their own evaluation, but really want to do a more rigorous research evaluation of it that would, could be more generalizable. But they may not have access to researchers. So if, if the research component isn't strong, that's where we would say, gee, this is a really good idea. Let's try and match them with a, a strong enough researcher. And there's no guarantee that that would then be funded. But we, I think we've gotten our first application now of somebody who's gone through the matching pro process. This is a fairly new innovation that we introduced last year. So the, answer, the brief answer is you don't have to have it all in place. The more that's in place, the more convincing it is, and or we would try and help with, with technical assistance or matching. 
Yeah, that's great. And I just want to take a second to underscore one of the points you just mentioned, Nancy, which is about the criteria or qualifications of a principal investigator. So evidence for action does not have maybe what might be considered traditional criteria for a PI, meaning anyone can serve as a principal investigator. There are no degree qualifications, uh, and it does not need to be the person who is actually carrying out the research. It's really up to the team to decide what makes best sense for your proposal. And so, as you mentioned, a community member could be a PI, and a researcher could be just a member of the team. As long as the team as the whole has the capacity to carry out the research, that's what we really care about. And there was a question that was submitted prior to the webinar about the fact that there are groups of people that have traditionally been neglected by the health research community, and how does Evidence for Action think about welcoming those groups of people? And so this is one of the ways in which we're trying to break down some of those um, power dynamics between community groups and researchers, uh, also the matching service and the technical, other technical assistance services, the design consultation are services that where we're trying to be better aware of the dynamics in research, especially research that happens in the real world. I will say that we, we do have to narrow our funding uh, solicitation in some ways because of limited resources on our own end, and so that's why we've focused on evaluations of intervention and interventions, and we really do stick to that criteria. So I know there's a number of other types of research that are underway, and um, and that are also important, but just not the right fit for evidence for action. Um, but we also believe that there is work that is underway by a diverse group of people and organizations uh, beyond the academic um, environment that are important and eligible for evidence for action funding. So another question has come up about review timelines. So just to give you a quick sense, when you submit a letter of intent, we review them on a rolling basis. Letters of intent are submitted daily, and so we truly review them day by day, week by week. There is a quite a big backlog in uh, the submission process, and so it often will take somewhere between six to even nine weeks before you will hear back from us about our decision on your letter of intent. Once we make a decision, if you are invited to submit a full proposal, you will have two months to make that submission. If you are invited to revise your letter of intent, there's no deadline for you to do that, nor is there a deadline ever for submitting a letter of intent or a new letter of intent if you have submitted one previously. At the full proposal stage, again, it usually takes us about six to eight weeks to re review and respond to the full proposal submissions. We could, again, at the full proposal stage, request revisions, which do not have a deadline. And then once we make a recommendation for funding, it, there is an additional 45-day budget and legal review. So the full process from initial submission of a letter of intent through actual funding is typically five to six months. In cases of natural experiments and time-sensitive events, we could award grants more quickly. I think our most expeditious process took about three months. And in cases where multiple revisions are requested, one at the letter of intent stage and another at the full proposal stage, it could take upwards of eight, nine months to finalize an award. All right, so the next question, and I realize we're getting close to the end, but I'm going to try to squeeze in just a couple more questions here. Um, is there a preference for any type of methodology over another? Um, and I know that we have touched a little bit on the importance of the um, causal inference and on the contextual relevance of the intervention and the setting in terms of selecting a methodology. But Nancy, any last comments about methods? Because this is really the sticking point for I think a lot of applicants. Well, the method that we want is the method that will best answer the question that you've posed. So we don't really have a preference for one specific kind of methodology, but we do put a, an emphasis on using a method that will allow you to, to really have a fair chance 
of finding out whether something really has an impact. Great. So a few people have asked about accessing technical assistance prior to the letter of intent submission or receiving feedback on a proposal prior to submission. So again, uh, I want to direct people, there is a registration link on our website for the technical assistance webinar that will be happening later that month. So please join us if you're interested in more details about TA. I will say that the way to access technical assistance is to submit a letter of intent. And so again, it's an invitation to technical assistance based on the intervention of interest still aligning with evidence for action goals and objectives. So um, it's not a guarantee and to some extent again is limited based on our resources, but we do, uh, th there are um, not the same requirements around the design and the methods at the letter of intent stage for applicants who are referred to technical assistance. This is really based on the intervention being relevant to building a culture of health and to evidence for actions um, goals. We do not provide feedback prior to submission. So we do not review written drafts. We do have a variety of mechanisms for contacting the program to discuss questions. Uh, I will say that typically it's not necessary, nor is it especially helpful to have a conversation about the issue that you're studying prior to submission. However, if you have questions about the methodology or the approach or the design, then you can reach out directly to the program office through a variety of contact mechanisms that I will share with you momentarily. And um, you can join us on the third Thursday of every month. So next Thursday, the 18th of April, will be our next third Thursday where we host sort of a virtual office hours. Um, and the, we do not do presentations like we're doing here today, but we just answer questions. And you don't need to sign up in advance. You can just join. Someone from our staff is there for about half an hour to answer questions that you might have about the program. So let me go ahead and share with you all the ways that you can contact us if you have questions. Again, we don't provide feedback prior to submission, but after submission, if you receive a turndown and you have questions, you can certainly visit our website where we have information about common causes for turndowns and other nuances about what is a good fit with the program. You can email us directly at evidenceforaction at ucsf.edu. You can give us a call. You can tweet at us. You can reach us on Facebook or LinkedIn. And as I mentioned, you can join us for Third Thursdays. There is again a link on our website to the Third Thursday um, to access Third Thursdays, which we host via Zoom. We really want to thank everyone who has joined us today. This presentation will be archived on our website in the next few days. And Nancy, any parting thoughts before we uh, tell some people on their day. No, I think we should let people go. Thank you again for participating. We really appreciate your interest in the program, and we look forward to many of your applications in the future.